Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on our Bible study this morning. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we read the book of Daniel. And Mark, learn and inwardly digest its contents and the videos associated with it. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so the book of... I'm probably going to end up saying this again and again. The book of Daniel is interesting for a variety of reasons, and we're going to watch... Um, one of our videos, pretty maybe two of them today, pretty quickly. But I do want to jump in to reading a little bit so that we can at least start it. Uh, one of the reasons it's interesting is that it almost certainly was written. Um, it, so it's it's it, in Christian Bibles, it's ri- listed as um, it's listed with the prophet books and in jewish bibles it's listed with the writings which are things like proverbs and that sort of thing and uh how do it's not like it's labeled as such it's that the different bibles are organized differently um the order or canon of the hebrew bible is one thing that was settled by jews give or take after 70 AD when the temple had been destroyed and they need to come up with a sort of common book across not just Jerusalem, but the whole region because a lot of the Jews had been sent out. And so they come up with a common canon and uh, that canon includes which books are in the Bible. It includes what versions of those books are in the Bible, and it includes where those books are in the Bible. So, for example, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are always the first five. And mostly as you go through, it's the same, but as you get deeper into it, certain books, and Daniel is one of them, get put into different locations um, uh, than they had been in the Greek versions or the Greek versions had them in different locations. But um, so here, and I, I'll spare you this, this is a Hebrew Bible, literally. Um, it is in Hebrew, right? Um, so good luck reading this. This is a Greek Bible and just Old Testament called the Septuagint, and it is written in Greek. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, so. Daniel in particular is complicated because um, of where it ends up. And in the Greek version, it's longer. There's a couple of extra chapters in it that are not in the Hebrew version. So as we go through, we're going to read Daniel, but then we're not going to stop until we've finished the extra stuff that's in the Greek version. And some of the history on that is why is there a Greek version? when Alexander the Great came down and conquered everything, at that point, Jews had already spread into different areas, and it became more convenient to have Greek translations of the uh, Hebrew scriptures. And so they translated them. And this is hundreds of years, you're around 200, 300 BC, before the, the Hebrew canon is established. And um has any of you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? I'm assuming most of you have. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, some of you went to Qumran and saw where they were and that sort of thing. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found versions, mostly in Hebrew, of parts of the Bible. And that uh, community predated the canon getting set up. And Basically, all it tells you is is that until after 70 AD, there was no set form of what the order of books was and even some of what was in the books, which is a little hard to wrap your head around sometimes. But um, what it means for us 2,000 years later in English is when we're reading Daniel or some of the other books, but Daniel in particular is like this, you're reading a Hebrew translation but often there'll be notes to what the Greek is, and they both matter. 
for Jews, they went with the uh, the Hebrew version, obviously. But the early church was using the Greek version. And so if you're in an Orthodox church or the Catholic church or the Episcopal church, um, your Bible is different. So a um, we know those extra books as uh, the Apocrypha. Anybody ever heard of that? Like the, the, there's, there's a section in our Bible that's usually in the middle called the Apocrypha. In Catholic world, that's called deuterocanonical books, and in the Orthodox world, they just know them as sort of secondary. So they were aware even back then that they were books that were not exactly shared across uh, Christians and Jews. So they viewed them as scripture, but sort of secondary to the ones that also appeared in Hebrew. Does that make any sense at all? I hope that makes some sense. Okay, so <clears throat> as we go through Daniel... Um, I'm actually, and we didn't do this last time, but I'm going to end up um, making a note of where we run into the Greek because it does matter because in a Catholic or an Orthodox Bible, um, they would have gone with the Greek version. And the reason it matters for us is anytime the New Testament gospels, letters of Paul, whomever is quoting or referencing from something like Daniel, they tend to be using the Greek version. So you kind of need to know both of them. Um, all right, so we're going to start by reading a little bit of Daniel and kind of go from there. But we're actually going to start by uh, looking at Ezekiel, which is not uh, in Daniel. Uh, Can I ask a quick question, Matt? Yes. When were these listings done? When? So uh, Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. And about the same time, the, the 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 Jews are kicked out of Jerusalem, basically, and it becomes a Roman, a fully Roman colony. And most of the Christians are also getting kicked out for different reasons of the same area. So Jews and Christians are spreading around 70 AD beyond that, um, and they need some set rule on what their scripture is or is not, because they're no longer centered in Jerusalem. And it's thought, it's hard to say with uh, for, for sure, but it's thought with the Jews that there was a council in a place called Jamnia, um, I think it's around 70 AD, where they uh, formally set, the rabbis and the leadership formally set what was and what was not in the, uh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible and um, that so certain things that are in Daniel um, in Greek only they said are not in there and their general rule of thumb was if it's in Hebrew it counts if it's not in Hebrew it's not going to count that's not entirely true because Daniel half of Daniel is written in Aramaic so it's like it's generally true and it's generally not true but for the most part if it was only written in Greek they said no it doesn't count we're not going to keep it um, and. There are different versions of some of these books. We'll see this right off the bat, where there's certain lines that show up in Greek versions that don't show up in Hebrew versions. Uh, but a 70 AD and beyond is what you're mostly thinking of that. With Christians, it takes longer. Uh, they're generally dealing with this Greek version of uh, the Hebrew scriptures, or the Old Testament, but the New Testament is still getting written. And so it takes a couple hundred years longer until they really settle on what books are in and what books are not in. And for the most part, they went with books that were could be traced directly to apostles. So Paul's letters all get in. Um, they fight over the letter to the Hebrews because. Uh, one half of the church, the Eastern Orthodox side of the church, did not have any tradition that Paul had written that. And the Western Catholic side of the church did. And so they fought over that. And Hebrews eventually gets in. The book of Revelation, I think, is the last one to get in. Um, and it got in under the argument that John of Patmos is the same John as um, John of Zebedee, which is probably not true. But uh, that gives you some idea that the same thing happened in Christianity, where certain books um, were 
late arrivals and others were not allowed in at all. There's a couple of books. Um, there's two letters from St. Clement, who is two generations off, and one of the early bishops of Rome, I think. And um, they were read as scripture for a while, but when they went down and kind of worked through what was going to be in the Bible or not, or the New Testament and not in the New Testament, because Clement obviously had not known Jesus personally, they said, no, this one's not in. And there's an other ones like the Shepherd of Hermas and things like that, that we don't read nowadays. But in the early church, they did read. And um, so anyway, does that sort of answer your question, Sherry? Thank okay. you. So that yeah. would have been like 400? Um, so when when Constantine comes around, it's got to get settled no matter what happens, okay. right? So, so in, in that interim time before that, they're working it out and mostly it's hashed out, um, you know, but there's a couple of books like Revelation that the, the I think the Orthodox Church, the, the Eastern Churches liked it and the Western Churches didn't. And I think the trade-off may have been, if you're going to get Revelation, we're going to get Hebrews. And they, they, they put them both in and and sort of tangentially trace them back to some apostle. Uh, but it's it takes a little bit of time. The Old Testament is quicker. And in general, when the Jews settle on what theirs is, the Christians are like, okay, that's the Jewish one. The Christian one is this one. But we do recognize that the extra books and bits and pieces that we have are secondary. And so they don't have, they, they still have scriptural authority, but they're viewed as well, what they're called in Catholic world is deuterocanonical. So they're secondary, but they're in the canon. Um, and in Protestant churches during the Reformation, they say, we have all these extra books and the Jews don't. Let's just focus on the Hebrew ones and keep that. That's why most Protestant Bibles don't have those. Um, the Episcopal Church went sort of classic middle road, and they kept this the secondary books, but put them in a separate collection and called them the Apocrypha. The Anglicans did that. Lutherans did that. There were a bunch of sort of mainline Protestants that did that, but the more radical Protestants just threw them away. So it takes many, many years. Anyway, they're in our Bible. Um, so we're going to start with Ezekiel, oddly enough, and th there's a reason for that. So let's see. Can you see my screen? My Ezekiel. Uh, Patrice, can you read this chunk of Ezekiel right here? The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, and I stretch out my hand against it and cut off its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off its humans and animals. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job, these three were in it, they would save only their own lives by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I send wild animals through the land to ravage it so that it may so that it is made desolate and no one may pass through because of the animals. Even if these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord, they would save neither sons nor daughters. They alone would be saved, but the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, let a sword pass through the land, and I cut off humans and animals from it, though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would save neither sons nor daughters, but they alone would be saved. Or if I send a pestilence into that, pour out my wrath upon it with a blood to cut off humans and animals from it. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would save neither son nor daughter. They would save only their own lives by their righteousness. Okay. Yes. So the only reason we're reading this is because you, you all know who Noah is. Everybody know who Job is? There's a book called Job. Um, Noah is prehistory, so to speak, with the flood. Job is the same era, and Daniel is lumped in by Ezekiel with them. The idea here is most likely Ezekiel, and this is Ezekiel is pre. It's like the the end of the uh, the the as the Babylonians are basically coming in is around when Ezekiel is. Um, so it's the beginning of the end, so to speak. And he's looking back at Noah, Daniel, and Job as these legendary perfect figures, right? So if in if you know only these three would be saved because they were righteous, um, right? Noah is, we know that because Noah's one of the few that gets saved. And 
Um, Job, the whole book is about how he's righteous, um, and even in the face of suffering, continues to be righteous. Daniel gets lumped in with them, which is odd when you're reading the book of Daniel, because the book of Daniel takes place after this. So um, that sets up the stage of who is Daniel, uh, which I'll get a little bit more about. This is, I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is also in Ezekiel, and it's a proclamation against the king of Tyre. Um, but right here, he's talking about um, to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord, because your heart is proud and you've said, I am a God, I sit on the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a mortal and no God, though you compare your mind with the mind of a God. You are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you, but your wisdom and your understanding. You have amassed wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you've increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you compare your mind with the mind of a God, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations. It keeps going. The idea here is that the king of Tyre is wise. He's still going to get punished, but he's wise like a legendary figure, such as Daniel. So these are, I think, the only two places where Daniel is mentioned. And it's interesting because theoretically, Ezekiel and Daniel would be kind of contemporaries of each other. But Ezekiel is not thinking of that. Ezekiel is thinking of Daniel as this historic, legendary person that lived long ago with people like Noah. And so when we get into Daniel... Uh, we will see some of these traits. He's legendary, he's very wise, um, but he's living somewhat contemporaneously with who Ezekiel was. And so it brings up the question of, did Daniel exist in that way or not? And this is one sign that perhaps Daniel, the name, the story is taken and uh it's used to tell a story hundreds of years later. You could say it was totally, you know, straight ahead fact, but there's another problem with it is that Daniel, the character seems to live for about a hundred years uh, in the book. And so, and spans multiple Kings and multiple kingdoms. And the third thing is that he ends up getting um, a lot right about all sorts of things, incredibly exact that happen across a couple hundred years span and then when it gets down to about 200, 190-ish BC, uh, suddenly he starts getting things wrong. And most scholars assume that that's around when the book was written and looking back um, in their own time to uh, tell a story about how to deal with bad things now by looking back um, at previous bad kings and how they deal with a current bad king. Does that make any sense? So are you saying Daniel is not a real person? Um, I'm saying that it seems to be, uh, I'm saying that most scholars will say that it's in a category of books where it's not that he wasn't a real person, It's but it's more <laughs> like a writing than a prophet. You're not telling a story about a, it's not written by a prophet about his prophecies. It's probably written hundreds of years later. And somebody like Daniel was a legendary figure and things got attached to his name. So the letter to the Hebrews, which I mentioned earlier, and the book of Revelation uh, get attached by the early church for authenticity to Paul and John, um, even though they probably were not written by Paul or John, of the uh, son of Zebedee. So that was something that went on back then. And our video from the professors, which we'll watch in a second, will do a better job of explaining that than I can, I think. Um, all right. So next, we're going to read the beginning of Daniel. Can you still see my screen if I switch to Daniel? Is it is it now on Daniel? Yes. 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 All right. Yes. Sandra, you got on first. Can you read um, through? Uh, well, just read the first paragraph. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, sorry. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to come up a lot. of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave King 
Jehalokim of Judah into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Okay, so this sets the scene. It's uh, King Jehoiakim is not exactly the last king of Judah in Jerusalem, but he's pretty close. And the Babylonian invasion happens while he's king. And all of the part of the captivity is, um, they don't take everybody. They take all of the high-end people. If it was today, they would go into New York City and they would take um, all of the high-end artisans and all of, you know, people that, that and all of the high-end tech people and all of the high-end lawyers and all, and they leave everybody else. So they take really all the high-end um, wealthy people back to Babylon. And with that, they take all the money too, which includes the vessels in the temple, which is the house of God. And he brings them to Shinar. And this little note here, A, goes down to a footnote. And it says, um, the Hebrew adds to the house of his own gods. So we're actually already reading a Greek version and not a Hebrew version uh, in this translation. So that's the stage that's set. And this gives you a crystal clear um, year when, and I'm going to forget it off the top of my head, so I'll look it up, but it gives you a crystal clear year of when the, um, the book is supposed to be taking place, which is right at the beginning of the Babylonian exile when Nebuchadnezzar is king. Um, any questions on that? Okay. No. Um, who, who hasn't read yet? Sherry, have you read? Did you read? You were on pretty early. Can you read this chunk? Um, I'll give you a, a heads up. It's um, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, Azariah, and Abednego. <laughs> but too, too bad those are all in the last sentence. Yes. <laughs> then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility. Young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight, and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years, so that at the end of that time, they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. So they're from the royal family and the nobility. They get different names. This will get confusing because they get referred to as uh, back and forth. The Chaldeans and the Babylonians are the same thing. They, they get different names as well. Um, but just be ready for that. But this, again, sets the basic stage. Um, uh, Carrie, can you read this paragraph? Starting with eight? Yeah. Okay. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion from the palace master. The palace master said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king. He has appointed your food and your drink. If he should see you in poorer condition than the other young men of your age, you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel asked the guard whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. You can then compare our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the royal rations and deal with your servants according to what you observe. So he agreed to this proposal and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was observed that they appeared better and fatter than all the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the guard continued to withdraw their royal rations and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. 
Daniel also had insight into all visions and dreams. Great. Okay. The things that here, I mean, it's about food tangentially, but it's, it's actually that God grants favor to Daniel and compassion. And this is sort of the first, I'm not sure I'd say it's miraculous, but um, the, the idea here is that these guys are eating basically a limited diet um, so that they don't have to eat non-kosher food. Right. Um, and think about it this way. They go from a land where there's no pigs because there's probably not very many pigs in um, in uh, Jerusalem and Judah. They're from the nobility. <laughs> they would have existed always um, as most likely quite kosher and that sort of thing. They go off to Babylon where they're eating pigs, food sacrificed to God, things prepared in all sorts of different ways. And so in order to keep kosher, they need to pretty much eat vegetables. And um, there's a worry that that because they're high up, they're going to get the palace master in trouble um, if they start looking gaunt and that sort of thing. So the sort of miracle at the beginning of this is that God keeps them okay, even with their limited diet. Um, and this is something that is the beginning of much more miraculous things that will happen. But basically the lesson here is stick with God, stick with your customs, stick with being kosher, and you'll be all right. All right. Uh, okay. Um, Jim, can you read 18 to the end? Okay. At the end of the time that the king had set for them to be brought in, the palace master brought them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. Among them all, no one was found to compare with Daniel, Hananiah, Mish, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they were stationed in the king's court. In every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel continued there until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, great. So we've got years are going to pass. We'll bounce around in our story a little bit. But the four of them, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, um, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, end up stationed in the court. And does this, any of this remind you of any other Old Testament type of thing that might have happened? Um, yeah, um, it's uh, Joseph. Joseph, correct. There's dreaming in Joseph. Um, how about Pharaoh's court with Moses, right? Where Moses and Aaron show up and they're better at magicianing stuff, right? Because God is with them than all of um, Pharaoh's people. So you get a mix of Joseph's dreams and wisdom and uh, also a, a, a comparison, I think, to uh, the other great uh, sort of exile, right? When they were down in Egypt, they were all right, and they bested all of the best of the best with Joseph and his dreams and with Moses and Aaron with the, the snake and the, the signs. Uh, Daniel and these three guys are like this as well. Um, as an aside, which will be more important later, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, if you ever pray morning prayer, these are the three young men. They're the, we have those, those, um, two songs, the one that is about creation that goes on and on and on, and the, the shorter one, which are called the Song of the Three Young Men. That's who these three guys are, and we'll run into their song uh, in a little bit. But any questions about chapter one or comments on it? Uh, yes. Anybody? All good? All right. Um, we're going to shift gears and watch our professor friends, uh, if I can figure out how to stop sharing. So buckle up and um, we're going into Yale for a few minutes. If I can find them. Okay. Um, do you see who was Daniel? Yes. Although it's blurred. How about now? Do you see John Collins? Yes. 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 All right. Um, this video is probably 12, 14 minutes, something like that. Again, if you can't 
hear him or see him, let me know, because I don't always know what you all can see. So I'm going to start and attempt to uh, expand. It. So, John. Can you hear him? And move? Is he moving? This time we're talking. No, no it's a blank screen. screen. Yes, see, no. Me, okay. All right. This is always happens. Let me, let me start again. Share screen. Okay. Now can you see him? No. There we go. Yes, I see him. All right. See, yes. Still. Okay. So this video is their, this is their first conversation about Daniel. So John, this time we're talking about the book of Daniel, a book that you are uh, one of the world's leading experts in. Uh, perhaps the place to start is with the name and the person. That is, this is a book that is named after its main character, much like many of the prophetic books that are named after, we assume, prophets who lived and spoke these words. That's not quite what's happening with Daniel. This is really a book about Daniel rather than a book by Daniel. Was there an actual Daniel? Most probably not. Now, I suppose there must have been some people called Daniel, mm -hmm. but not the person who's described in this book. So what we get is, in the first six chapters or so, is the development of a persona, mm -hmm. so that there's a certain character, you might even say invented. Now, we know that Daniel was a name attached to a legendary famous person because it comes up twice in the book of Ezekiel, where he's linked with people like Noah and Job. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the, the question asked, are you wiser than Daniel? Now, if you believe what, literally what's in the book of Daniel, uh, Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries. Right. But obviously, the allusions here are to a famous ancient person. Somebody like Noah, you know, back in the time of the flood, or Job, where nobody knows when he was supposed to have lived. Right. So, and th there's yeah. there's a reference to there are references to a Daniel-like figure, at least a similar name, right? Daniel, even back in Ugaritic literature from the 13th, 14th century BC. There, there are now. It should be said, you know, the character in the Book of Daniel isn't much like the right. character in the Ugaritic uh, scores. But really, I think Daniel, they just take the name mm -hmm. and they give him a new persona. Now, the name yeah. means something like, God is my judge. Mm -hmm. um, you, he only shows up judging once, actually, in the story of Susanna, and we probably won't even get to talk about that, right. given certain people's canonical prejudices. <laughs> but... Um, but, but the, the character that we have here is supposedly a young man deported from Jerusalem to Babylon mm -hmm. and then singled out with a couple of his companions uh, for a special education. Yeah, what we have really throughout the book, and you know, we'll get into the details as we, as we go through the chapters in more detail, but there is sort of story after story of this Daniel figure in generation after generation, but his role is the same in, in almost every case. That is, he is almost always some sort of advisor or wise person or dream interpreter, in, specifically situated in the foreign courts of, uh, of the king, uh, which makes Daniel part of a larger genre of, uh, of tales, of which there are numerous examples elsewhere in the Bible already. Indeed. Uh, now, the, the, the length of his career is one of the problems. It is. Uh, if you, you know, ask, why can't you take this as historically accurate? Mm -hmm. Well, he's supposedly a, a young man in his late teens, perhaps, in 597, although the, the, the actual date of the deportation is a bit botched in the mm -hmm. book as well. But then he goes on all the way to Cyrus of Persia, this is a good 60 years later, and he's still in business. Yeah. Now, that's stretching it, maybe not entirely impossible. Right. There are worse stretches in the <laughs> book. Uh, we'll meet a character called Darius the Mede, not known to history outside of the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. whereas Darius was the name of a couple of the Persian kings. Right. Uh, the, 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 how they get the Medes in there is another question mm -hmm. because the Medes never had anything to do with the Judeans at all. Yeah, I think there's a general question when you read the book of Daniel about its historical setting. Uh, 
It is set originally, as you said, in the time of the Babylonian exile. It then stretches in time into the rise of Persia. When approximately would we think that the book was written? Well, I suppose we need to back up one other step. The book, it falls very obviously into two halves. Mm -hmm. And it does this in two different ways. Because if you think in terms of genre, the first six chapters are stories about Daniel. Mm -hmm. And as you say, this is a common enough type of story. Joseph, Some, Esther. Joseph, Esther being the, the famous examples. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a very definite pattern to it. Mm -hmm. uh, several of them end in very much the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like watching episodes in a sitcom. That's right. Uh, now, the other division is by language. Right. Because six chapters of the book of Daniel are in Aramaic. And it's not just the first six, right. it's chapters two to seven. Yeah. And this is, no, okay, what, what do we infer from this? The, the basic stories, I would figure, originally were in Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Probably circulated orally, mm -hmm. went through a fairly long process of transmission. And then at some point, somebody wanted to pull these together and wrote a nice introduction to them. Mm -hmm. And now that may have been in Aramaic, but we don't have it in Aramaic. My guess is that it was translated into Hebrew mm -hmm. when they were editing the whole book as a way of kind of tying the book together. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in the second century BC, in the time of the Maccabees, in the time of stirring events that we need to talk about in a little bit more Very detail, well. um, then somebody wrote visions in the name of Daniel. Now, these are quite different in genres, different kind of literature from what you have in the first six chapters. Mm -hmm. But the first one of these is also in Aramaic. And then they switch to Hebrew. Hmm. Now, you've got to figure that they were bilingual, but at the same time, I think probably it's in the enthusiasm of the Maccabean revolt and the, the kind of Judean revival of that period <clears throat> that you get the preference for Hebrew. Right. And it should be said the Hebrew is very bad. <laughs> right. So what we're looking at is really a book that probably spans a significant uh, length of time in terms of its composition. It might not have been composed as early as the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, where, where it starts in, in terms of narrative. But there's no reason to think that some parts of it weren't relatively early, and then other parts of it are, are much later. That's right. At the first, uh, the stories you know, probably go back you know, in some form to the Persian period, mm -hmm. uh, but f at least to the third century. Mm -hmm. But these, I would assume, you know, evolved over time. But then once you get to the visions, these were all written within the space of about three or four years. Right. And, and we, we know, know this that. because they have historical reference. Because they have historical references. Mm -hmm. And you know, as far as the date of the book as a whole goes, uh, in the last vision in the book, there's a long prediction of history, yes. and it ends with the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, which is not mentioned by name, but he's very recognizable. Mm -hmm. And they get that wrong. They've gotten everything else right up to that point, uh -huh. except that they say that he will die between the sea and the holy mountain. Whereas, in fact, he died. He, he died over in the east in Parthia. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this gives us a very nice date for the final composition of the book. It was before the death of the king, which happened in December of 164 BCE. Before that was known in Jerusalem. Right. This must have been finished. Good. So, so what we have then is um, uh, stories about a figure, and then that figure has sort of been elevated and used for visions later on. Uh, somewhat separate from, from the original stories. Uh, and this is actually, this is a process that we know from other biblical figures who, where the figure sort of emerges from, from its original context and is reused. You can think uh, certainly of figures like Ezra, who uh, is the, yes. you know, the, the scribe in, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then in later, uh, later writings becomes you know, far, more, uh, far more important and also receives visions and the like. Um, this seems to be another yeah. sort of part of that kind of uh, kind of reuse yeah. of a character. 
even arguably, I suppose you could say Moses. I would, but, I you know, would you certainly get, say you know, Moses. A huge tradition that he picks up as he goes along. And I should say, in the case of Daniel, uh, there are other Danielic books besides the ones we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, in the Greek Bible, you already have two stories added at the end, the story of Baal and the dragon and the story of Susanna. Right. And there are prayers inserted in chapter 3, the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three young men in mm -hmm. the fiery furnace. And then in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have at least two other compositions, uh, at, at least two that mention Daniel by name, that are like the kind of revelations you have at the second half of Daniel. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they are necessarily dependent on it. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, this would indicate that it was fashionable at some point to make, have compositions in the name of Daniel. And also that what we're looking at is something of an open corpus. That is, the Daniel that we have as a book need not have been... Right? <clears throat> there were other ways that you could have included, as you say, the Greek has more Daniel than the, yeah. than the, uh, than the Hebrew. Uh, some of these Dead Sea, uh, Dead sea compositions could have also been in it. Was, it was sort of a, a rolling corpus that allowed for more to, to enter yes, into it. Yes, and it's a little bit arbitrary where mm -hmm. you cut it off. Right. And even within the book as we have it, the Greek of chapters 4 and 5 is wildly different from what we have in the Aramaic. And that, again, I think indicates probably oral transmission. Right. But it, it would seem that a lot of, I mean, a lot of the fact that some of the stories are repetitive, are very similar to each other. Yeah. Chapters 3 and 6 are very similar. Chapters 7 and 8 are very similar. I mean, we have very similar kinds of material as if we have, as we said, sort of a collection of all of yes. the Daniel material that was out there or that somebody could get their hands on. Um, yeah. Now, uh, you know, you raised the question, comparing this with some of the prophets, mm -hmm. this isn't actually supposed to be a book written by Daniel. Now, the second half of it is re reports by Daniel, mm -hmm. all right, but the first half isn't. I think, but when you get into the part that is put in the mouth of Daniel, this brings us to the problem of pseudepigraphy. Mm -hmm. And this is something that still bothers some people, but, now and then. but I don't think either of us is, is one of those people. I don't no. think either of us is bothered by the idea of an ancient writer putting his ideas in the mouth of a famous, uh, famous sort of no, sage actually, of Israel. If you read enough ancient literature, you realize this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a very common thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a famous professor at Oxford in the middle of the 19th century named Pusey who said that if Daniel did not indeed speak these things, he must have lied on a frightful scale. Mm -hmm. Or somebody must have lied on a frightful yeah. scale. Now, you see, that is actually a lack of any kind of literary sensitivity, right. uh, of an appreciation of literary conventions. So, so <clears throat> let me ask this then. How, as people coming to the book of Daniel now, recognizing it as a collection of stories somewhat arbitrary, not quite historical, written over a period of time. Is there a way of reading the book sort of as a whole, of making sense of this as a, as a unit of literature? How do we think about Daniel um, as, we, as we come to it today with, with this sort of knowledge in mind? Well, you see, there are certain themes that unite the book. And I'd say the main one is the revelation of mysteries. Mm -hmm. This is what Daniel is good at. Now, so in chapter 2, we'll find he interprets a dream. In chapter 4, he interprets a dream. Later on, he'll interpret writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, sets the stage for further revelation of mysteries. They get upgraded in the second half of the book. Daniel can't understand them anymore. You need an angel to come in. But there's some continuity in that. Mm -hmm. There is also some continuity in the idea of people's lives being put at risk because of the stand they take for their faith. Now, in the first half of the book, it's the three young men get thrown into a fiery furnace. Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den. At the end of the book, you'll hear of the wise, so-called, mm -hmm. the Hebrew is maskilim, who, uh, who will be, you know, in a time of persecution, some of them will be killed. 
And uh, now, again, there are differences, because in the first half, there's this miraculous deliverance at the last minute. In the second half, you've got to wait for a resurrection. Right. And so uh, there is continuity, all right, but at the same time, there's a really abrupt change. Yeah. I think one of the one of the exciting things about about talking about Daniel is it really unlike almost any other book in uh, in the Old Testament, uh, and so I'm excited that we're going to get a chance to to get into it uh, in a little more detail. Okay. All right. So a couple of things before we wind down. Um, why are we reading Daniel? If you remember, the original request was to read Revelation, and we're not reading Revelation until we've read Daniel. Um, the the reason is because of two things. Revelation relies really heavily on a lot of imagery taken directly out of Daniel, and it follows a similar pattern. And um, as we move a little forward in the book, and if you read it already, some of this stuff will come to mind. Um, the one of the initial visions is about four kingdoms that starts with the gold one and works its way down to to clay and that sort of thing and you can map that out pretty clearly that it's the babylonians and then it's the persians and then it's the greeks right um so you've got uh nebuchadnezzar and then uh, who's the Persian? Is it Cyrus? Um, and then Alexander the Great. And then anybody know who follows the Greeks? What giant big empire controlled the whole region? The Romans are the next one, right? And by the time we get to, as we read through Daniel, you'll get a sense that Daniel, the character, navigates both the Babylonians and the Persians and then he really does begin to talk about um, the Greeks and the Romans, a character named Antiochus Epiphanes, um, who was not a very good guy. But they mentioned the Maccabees, right? The Maccabees are like 160-something BC, and they're revolting against um, not exactly the Romans, but basically the Romans in the form of Antiochus Epiphanes. And one of the things about this book is that uh, it takes the Babylonian exile, and which was supposed to and sort of did last 70 years, but realistically, it kind of kept going. There were people that stayed in exile in different places that never came back that were still faithful Jews. Um, it was never the restoration that they were hoping. The temple that got rebuilt was never as glamorous or as big as the one that was remembered with Solomon. The They never restored the monarchy. It was always under these different empires that were around um, overlording it. And so the question becomes, we thought it was supposed to be 70 years and then everything was restored perfectly. And then you get the vision of Daniel at the end, if you read the whole thing, where he talks about, no, 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 it's 70 times 7, and which extends you hundreds of years later and gets you to the Maccabees. <coughs> Again, the, the Babylonian exile starts in 597. The Maccabees are like 160. So you got a good 400 years there. And it extends all the way to the Maccabees, which you're beginning to get into um, stuff that Jesus's time would be more familiar with. And when we get to Jesus, you have the Romans are still there, and the book of Revelation begins to try to answer the question of, we thought all this restoration was going to happen. Um, when is it going to happen? And in Revelation, they pick up a lot of the themes from the end of Daniel uh, the idea of the resurrection and the Son of Man coming on the clouds and that sort of thing, and begin to project into the future um, that the full restoration of the new Jerusalem, which is a big theme in Revelation, um, will come at the end of time. And uh, and they kind of give up on the idea that there's ever going to be a full earthly restoration of the monarchy and the perfect temple and everybody's going to come back and begin to think of it in more apocalyptic terms. So that's kind of why we're reading Daniel. 
is to give a sense when we read Revelation of what it's like. Um, any questions or comments um, about anything? This is going to be far more confusing than um, the uh, Psalms were, for what it's worth. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting book. I do recommend, if you haven't read it, to read the whole thing. Um, and my guess is, if you listen to what the professors said, uh, for what it's worth, if you weren't on early, John Collins literally is, they're both at Yale, but he literally is probably the foremost Daniel scholar in the world. And uh, uh, the other guy is a, a formidable Jewish scholar, and his name is slipping me right now, but they're both excellent. And um, if you read the book of Daniel, my guess is you'll really like chapters one through six. And when you get to chapter seven, it will be like, this is a confusing mess. Um, we will, as we go through, begin to try to explain why they go together and um, and that sort of thing. So, all right, um, next week, no class. I'm going to be on a college visit with, uh, with, with my son. So um, we will reconvene in two weeks. Any final comments or questions? All right. Thank you all. See you in Thank two you. weeks. Uh, thank you.